around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford, and as always, we'd like to welcome everyone tonight to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Let me humbly say thank you for your love, your prayers, your financial support for this ministry. I'm so grateful for what you do for this ministry that we might continue to proclaim the Word of God without compromise. I'm very mindful of everything that you do for this ministry. I am a mere steward of my time, my gifts, my talents, and I'm a steward of the trust and the money you place into my hands. As most of you know, watching this telecast, we never make any kind of an appeal for money. I go as far as to say, if you hear me asking, begging, pleading for money, I'm backslid, I've drifted away from God, there's something wrong in my life. Why would you say that? Because I am so fearful of God, and I don't want to become a money changer, a money-grubbing, greedy preacher. Every minister that's handled the Word of God is going to stand before God for those things. And I want to stand before God with clean hands and a pure heart. And I mean that. I mean that. And what sacrifices you make, your money is very judiciously spent. We, I, 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 as my grandma would say, I'm, I'm tighter than Dick's hat band. I, 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 I'll, I'll pinch pennies left and right. Why? Because this is God's money. I said, this is God, the Holy Ghost money. And God bears witness with your spirit that I'm preaching the truth. And you help me. You help me bear the burden. I'm mindful of that. And I'm aware of that. And I'm so conscious of that. I want to be careful to never fall into the snare of the trap. If he, uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 10 says, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after they have erred from the faith. That word erred in the Greek means, means they have been seduced from the faith. They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I never hear preachers preach that passage. The love of money is the root of all evil, which some men have coveted after. They have erred from the faith erred, been seduced from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You may have seen it just a couple weeks ago. A man at his wife and his wife in a church in New York City were live streaming their services, and some hoodlums came into sanctuary and stole a million dollars worth of jewelry off of them. Let me show you what kind of jewelry I wear. A $30 Timex. If someone broke into this studio and stole my watch, I have three more just like this in my bedroom. I buy them three and four at a time because it's just a watch. It tells me the date and the time. I invest all of my energies and your monies in the kingdom of God and not in uh, an, ostentati an ostentatious way or opulent way but in a very judicious way because I want to do that which is right. We started a new series entitled, Has America Become a Harlot Nation? This is the third part of this series. This is going to be a very extended series. We're not even into the scriptures yet. This is my, 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 my prologue. I'm just Laying a foundation of what the Lord has laid upon my heart regarding Jeremiah chapter 2. If you want to read the entire chapter, read it. I will be going through every verse. But right now, we left off last week talking about sanctification, a word that you never hear mentioned in church anymore. Yet it's the word of God. I shared with you closing out last week and 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. I left off how your body is the temple of the Lord. And that the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, he dwells, he lives in this clay jar. And when he has a place of residence in your heart, he convicts, he reproves, he rebukes, he exhorts, he comforts, he guides, he orders our steps. But when he does not have a place of residence, we are unable to be led as the Spirit of God wills to guide and lead us. We're told in Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do you not want to be led by the Holy Ghost? Matthew 4, 1 says, immediately, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Holy Ghost led Christ into the temptation. And every temptation that Satan brought the way of escape was this book. Every time the devil said something to Christ, Jesus would reply, it is written, it is written, it is written. My friend, if you want great, great, great dynamic power in your life, get filled, get full of the Holy Ghost, and get full of the Word of Almighty God. You'll have power like you've never seen, ever known, ever experienced before in your life, and you can always... Through the grace of God, say no to the devil. Oh, he's going to come to you. He's going to try to lure you, to snare you, to deceive you, to manipulate you, to coerce you, and to ultimately trap you and then damn you. That's the protocol of Lucifer. He's a thief. John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal to kill, and to destroy. Remember that. When Satan comes, those are the three things he wants to do in your life. Kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to literally annihilate and destroy you because he's, he hates you with a, a demonic hatred because he is evil. Getting back to sanctification. 2 Timothy 2, 21, Paul said, If a man therefore shall purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. You must be purged of sin. I said you must be purged of sin. And if you do not purge yourself, I said if you do not purge yourself, God will purge you of himself. Oh, now, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty crass, preacher. That, that, that's pretty hard, preacher. Are you sure? Revelation 3, verses 15, 16 says, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I wouldst thou were cold nor hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I will purge thee out of my mouth. If we don't purge ourselves of sin, vile and filthy wickedness, God says, I'll purge myself of you. Oh, now that's not the kind of God that we serve. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm giving you the meat of the fullness, and I always say this, I want to bring to everyone watching a balanced dietary program of the Word of God. I believe everything that this book says, everything that are written on these sacred pages, I believe them, and I want you to have faith. I want you to prosper. I want you to bless. But America cannot be blessed. America cannot be prosperous if we live in filth and sin and degradation. We have to live right to have the blessings of God. Let me quote it again. 2 Timothy 2.21, If a man therefore shall purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel sanctified and meet. M-E-E-T, meat for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. 
Now, the word meat in the Greek means to be readily available, profitable, or acceptable for the master's service. God will not use just anyone or anything. Paul says he wants sanctified vessels that have been set apart and are meat, meaning we're available, we're profitable, and we are acceptable for the master's service. If you serve God, you are his servant. If you serve sin, you're the devil's servant. John 8, 34, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that committeth sin or liveth a lifestyle of sin is the servant of sin. Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. I had a man one day ask me, what is mammon? I said, it's money, greed, covetousness. No man can serve two masters, Jesus said. You either serve the Lord God of Israel or you either serve the devil. You, you can't be in the middle. This is the problem with the modern church. We want to be in the middle of the road. You better get on the Lord's side like Moses said. You know, Korah said, hey, y'all come on our side. Moses didn't say, come on my side. Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? You see, I understand whose side I'm supposed to be on. That's the Lord's. Paul then says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace of God given to me, to every man that is among you, to not think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly, like a sober man, not a drunk man, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Paul said, church, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, H-O-L-Y, holy, sanctified, set apart. Present your body a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And he said, this is a reasonable service. This is a reasonable request from God. And you present your body a living sacrifice, which is to be acceptable unto God. And then he says, be not conformed to this world. Sadly, the world is changing the church and the world and its systems will not change the church for the better, but it will only change the church for worse. As I shared several programs back, the church I was born in, the church I was raised in, something has happened terribly in the church. The church is a degenerate, decaying vine today. It is full of malnutrition. It is emaciated. It is a powerless church. Yet Jesus on, on the death Pentecost prophesied before that day in Acts 1.8. He said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and under the most utter parts of the earth. We've lost the witnessing power of the Holy Ghost of God. He is the power that elevates you and I to a place to witness, to preach, to teach, to pray, to sing, to minister. It is the Holy Ghost anointing, the Holy Ghost anointing that brings this. I've been asked before, what is the anointing? Friend, the Holy Ghost is the anointing. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. God through the Holy Ghost was with Jesus the Lord's Christ and that's why he had this great power and such a great following. Why? There was power there. 
to heal, to minister, to save, to cleanse, to forgive, to feed, to clothe, whatever the case might be. Jesus, now through the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is the high, the high sheriff in the earth. I said the Holy Ghost is the high sheriff in the earth. He's, he's to continue to have preeminence, but the worldly carnal church has usurped that authority and lordship. And we've tried to change it into something that the world will like. Listen, I've been in the world. I lived in a backslidden condition for about seven years. And all the world was doing was damning and destroying my life. That's all the world does. Let me tell you this about the world. When the devil has destroyed you and utterly ruined you, and done everything he can to damn you. He then cast you on the heap pile of ruination. Just like a landfill where all the garbage is taken. That's where Satan takes people to the landfill and buries them in death, rot, ruin, and decay. That's the enemy. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I want to get you out of the miry clay. I want to get you out of the horrible pit. I want to put your feet on a solid rock. I want to put a song in your heart, a skip, a dance in your feet, and a praise in your mouth, a praise in your lips. That's what I want to give you, Jesus says. And why the church wants to offer the world the world, I don't understand. The church should be offering the world Jesus, the one who gives the fountain of living water. Clean water, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled water that revives a man that's almost dead in his sins and about to pass out into eternity. The fountain of living water, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He comes. He comes. He revives. He revamps. He restores. And he puts that song in your heart, that dance in your step. You know you've been touched because there's joy where there was once trouble and anxiety and, and perplexing situations. Oh, you're going to have trouble in the world. John 16, 33, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world because Jesus overcame. You and I can overcome. Jesus was our example. And the Garden of Gethsemane, while he's praying, He's praying, he's agonizing profusely. Luke said in Luke twenty two forty four, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. His capillaries dilated, they burst within his blood vessels. Instead of sweat coming from his pores, blood came out of his pores. Being in an agony agonizing with hell and, and death and Satan. He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. You see, you and I have never agonized to that degree. But he agonized to that degree to save you from going to a devil's hell. I have a brother who said to me one time, God has never done anything for me. And I said, my, 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 my. I said, when your second son was born, they didn't think he would live. You phoned me and begged me to come to Greenville, South Carolina to the hospital. To come down there and lay my hands on that infant child that was about to die. And God spared that child's life. And you have the audacity to say God has never done anything for you. You see, that's how far sin will take you. God, Jesus, has done more for me than anybody else in this world. I was worse than the worst. I wasn't fit to be redeemed. I wasn't fit to be forgiven. I wasn't fit to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. 
But Paul said in Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, wherein with his great love he loved us. God was rich in mercy to you. You're watching me tonight. You're not living right. You put on a show. You put on a front. You want people to think you're a Christian, but the truth is deep down inside, you're not living where you need to live. It's time to forcefully turn loose of the world, turn loose of the weights, turn loose of the sins that doth so easily beset you and turn to Jesus, the Lord's Christ, and say, God, touch me one more time. Touch me with the freshness of the Holy Spirit of God like water in a parched land, a barren and desert land. God, touch my soul. And God calls me to be revived and to come forth and live again. God can do that. David said, can spilt water be gathered up again? Two-thirds of America is in a drought right now. The mid to the far west is in a terrible drought. One of the greatest droughts we've seen in over 1,200 years. God said, I'll shut up heaven. I'll shut up heaven. You will know there's a true and living God. The only thing that's holding America together right now, I believe, is the prayers of the saints of God. This nation is so restless. This nation is so tenuous. Merrick Garland, the attorney general, I said back in June, I said they want him to bring charges against Donald J. Trump. If you want a civil war in America, go and do that. Don't you think the devil doesn't want to initiate civil war in this nation again and shred it and tear it apart at the seams and destroy it because of sin and wickedness? This is why this is happening in this nation. It's because of sin. It's because of filth, wickedness, iniquity. This is why this nation is in such turmoil, and it's only going to get worse. You may not like this preacher. You may hate, you may loathe, you may despise this preacher, but I'm telling you the truth without compromise. I love you. I care about where you're going to spend eternity. I'm not going to garnish you and pamper you and protect you and pad you and throw out all this rosy stuff to you and make you think everything is fine, folks. It's not fine right now. It's not good right now. We're in a very dangerous and tenuous state in this nation. God can bring judgment on America tomorrow. And I've said for years, following 9-11, if God does not incrementally judge this nation a little at a time, We'll end up as Sodom and Gomorrah and nothing will be left. Oh, that won't happen. That won't happen. Don't you tempt God. You're not where you need to be. You, you know you're living with a man, ma'am. Sir, you're living with a woman. It, it, it's, it's just not right. It's, it, it grieves the Holy Ghost in every sense of the word. And, and, and sir and ma'am, your fidelity in your marriage is gone. You think this is all right. You, you think it's okay to, to have your tryst and, and meet and meet at a motel and have an adulterous affair. It grieves the Holy Ghost of God. And preacher, yes, I'm talking to you too. We're not exempt. We don't carry an exemption card in our wallet that says, oh, you can preach, but you can still live anyway. That's not true. We're going to be held to a higher standard than the lay people. And, I, and I've come to discern and understand this. Preachers, we're not staying in the prayer chamber long enough. You stay in the prayer chamber with God and the Holy Ghost will change you. He will convict you. He will reprove you. He will also correct you and tell you you're wrong. You know why he does that? Because he loves us. 
God loves us so much. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we're not living right, God commends his love toward us. But don't think the day will not come when God says, I'm done. I have pled. I have begged. My Holy Ghost has come time and time and time again and knocked at the door. And you refuse to come and open the door and let me come in and sup with you and you sup with me. And the day will come when you want to hear that knock. But you won't hear that knock anymore because the Holy Ghost has left and taken flight and said, I'm done. Genesis chapter 6 verse 3 says, My spirit will not always strive with man. That word strive in the Hebrew means God will not keep contending for your soul. I'm trying to bring you to the cross that you might receive your sight and know the way, the truth, and the life. I want to pray again. Father, I humbly come before your august throne. God, be merciful to us. Be merciful to those who are watching the telecast. The men, the women, the young people that sit there and the Holy Ghost is speaking to them. Holy Ghost, you're smiting their hearts. You're convicting them of their iniquities. You're convicting them of their sins. You're convicting them, Lord, of their evil ways. Now, sinner, friend, backslider, yield yourself to the spirit of grace. Let God open up that fountain of grace upon your heart and life. Let God restore. Let God redeem. Let God revive. Let God pull you again from the miry clay and the horrible pit and put your feet on the solid foundation, which is none other than Jesus Christ. God, I pray for America. I pray for a spiritual awakening in this nation. God, stir every man that you've called to preach your word. Stir them. Rob them of their sleep and their rest until they start preaching uncompromisingly your word, Father. You can do anything because you are the God of all flesh. Take this telecast, Lord, and use it for your honor, your praise, and your glory. And we ask it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I'll see you next week in the Lord. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.